Some Shakespeare scholars study what could be, but aren't, called authorship questions. Uh, that would be authorship questions uh, not capital capitalized. These questions revolve around Shakespeare's collaborations with other playwrights, mostly at the beginning and the ending of his career. Uh, collaboration includes contributions by other playwrights to works traditionally attributed to Shakespeare alone and Shakespeare's uh, possible contributions to works not generally attributed to him. The editors of the new Oxford Shakespeare, for instance, uh, attribute authorship of various plays to William Shakespeare, George Peel, Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Nash, Thomas Middleton, George Wilkins, John Fletcher, and one or more anonymouses. Anonymai. <laughs> In addition, they and others have suggested possible collaborations with Ben Jonson, Thomas Haywood, Thomas Kidd, Henry Chettle, Anthony Munday, and others. Outside uh, of university English departments and academic circles generally, some independent researchers consider the Shakespeare authorship question, which is capitalized, of course. Um, <laughs> A critical assumption of the Shakespeare authorship question is that Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare. Indeed, Shakespeare is very nearly the only person alive in Tudor and Jacobean England uh, who is not considered a contender for having written Shakespeare. Dozens and dozens of real Shakespeare's, and literally dozens and dozens of real Shakespeare's, have been proposed in thousands of books articles, blog posts, and incoherent screeds. <laughs> the most popular contenders have been and remain statesman Francis Bacon, uh, po poet, playwright, and possible spy Christopher Marlowe. By the way, that is probably not actually a portrait of Christopher Marlowe, but everyone assumes it is, and it's on the cover of all, uh, <laughs> copies of all his plays. Um, and of course, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, and winner of the All England Best Hat Award for 1575. Marlowe now uh, fits awkwardly into two camps, possible Shakespeare collaborator, as well as alleged real Shakespeare. Although some English teachers embrace the notion that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare, most Shakespeare scholars feel the same sort of warmth and enthusiasm for the idea that astrophysicists uh, feel for the conspiracy theory that the Apollo moon landings uh, were filmed on a terrestrial movie set. Scholars disdain the Shakespeare authorship question because there's no sensible reason to think that Shakespeare didn't write the plays and poems attributed to him, and quite a lot of evidence to suggest that, in fact, he did. He didn't need to attend a university to gain the knowledge necessary to write the plays. Uh, a grammar school education, which he probably had, uh, would have been quite sufficient. He didn't need to be a world traveler to uh, bestow on every town in Italy uh, a harbor, no matter how landlocked it happened to be. <laughs> the fact that he didn't specifically mention books and plays in his uh, will doesn't mean that he was illiterate. Uh, and didn't have any books. It doesn't matter how he spelled his name or what his handwriting looked like. There's simply no evidence that bars him from authorship. In addition, the vast number of suggested candidates indicates how little really convincing evidence exists to su support the claims for any single one of them. The Shakespeare authorship controversy is a conspiracy theory. Uh, and and an example of anti-intellectualism. Experts in the field are automatically distrusted, uh, their neutrality questioned, that, uh, assuming that they're part of big Shakespeare, um, <laughs> and their expertise and special knowledge largely ignored. Uh, after all, it's just reading. Um, 
unlike <laughs> from the other English professor in the room, <laughs> unlike many other conspiracy theories, however, Shakespeare denialism has received sympathetic treatment in some unexpected places. In 1989, PBS's Frontline aired The Shakespeare Mystery, which argued for uh, Ox Oxford's authorship. This was uh, followed by Uncovering Shakespeare, an update also uh, on Oxford, and Much Ado About Something uh, in 2001, which argued for Marlowe's authorship. Uh, when the Shakespeare mystery re-ran in the 1990s, some colleagues uh, and I, you know, we were really worried about Frontline, um, wondering, has it really always been this bad and we just didn't know because it wasn't our field? Um, because honestly, it would be like tuning into Nova and seeing that. Um, <laughs> because it, it, it's, it's the same sort of thing. Not to be outdone, NPR's morning edition ran a story called the real Shakespeare evidence points to Earl. Uh, host Renee Montaigne was later presented with the Distinguished Achievement in the Arts Award at the 13th Annual Authorship Studies Conference. In addition, the New York Times has run a series of Teach the Controversy uh, articles by Oxford leading columnist William Niederkorn. This is a great name. And Late last year, the Australian Skeptics National Convention uh, featured a speaker named Timothy Van Gelder, who, according to his convention biography, is an applied epistem uh, epistemologist who has particular interests in reasoning, argumentation, and critical thinking, and has developed software packages and online platforms for structured deliberations. He is not the bio concludes, a Shakespeare scholar. Uh, nonetheless, his presentation, titled Probabilistic Reasoning, Two Out of Three Ain't Bard, yeah. <laughs> considered the authorship of Shakespeare's works. His abstract reads as follows. Did, did William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon write the works published under the name William Shakespeare? Many authorities regard the Shakespeare authorship question as yet another nutty conspiracy theory. A properly skeptical attitude, however, is to consider any serious hypotheses on their merits. In this talk, I will give a brief overview of the conundrum and some reasons for thinking that the latest alternative candidate, Sir Henry Neville, uh, may well be more plausible than either Shakespeare or the previous best contender, Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. More importantly, however, my talk will be about how to think about these kinds of problems, and in particular, how to apply broadly Bayesian principles of prob <laughs> probabilistic reasoning. On his blog, Van Gelder says, although mainstream, mainstream scholars tend to haughtily dismiss the issue, there are very serious problems with the hypothesis that the author was William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon. This is true in, in much the same way that it's true that although many mainstream scholars tend to haughtily dismiss the issue, there are very serious problems with the hypothesis that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Really, it's the same kind of thing. The Australian skeptics uh, may have well had a young Earth creationist, a climate change skeptic, a uh, Holocaust skeptic appear and present their patently wrong belief uh, using Bayesian probability. Uh, it's not a properly skeptical attitude to seriously consider a soundly debunked hypothesis and dismiss real experts in the field as haughty. Uh, Bayesian probability doesn't trump appropriate expertise, especially if you're not using the right data. Over the past eight years and various blogs and talks, I've gone over the supposed arguments against Shakespeare's authorship and noted why they're fallacious, misleading, or, you know, wrong. Uh, and I'll touch uh, on a few of those uh, in this talk. However, it has occurred to me that the problem really isn't that the arguments are wrong, it's that they're not even wrong. 
Um, in other words, Shakespeare deniers often build their argument, arguments on the wrong kinds of data. Uh, and that plays havoc with your uh, Bayesian statistics. So since the 19th century, some Shakespeare truthers have based their arguments on incredibly elaborate ciphers and codes. Uh, and with the popularity of things like the Bible Code, the Da Vinci Code, cipher-based arguments do still exist. In fact, part of the alleged evidence for Henry Neville's authorship is based on deciphering the dedication of the sonnets. Uh, this dedication has been deciphered many times before with different results, um, despite the fact that it was written by the, the printer, not the author. <laughs> Whatever. Um, all codes and ciphers are problematic for a variety of reasons, but for one thing, many of them depend on a, a fatal ignorance of how Renaissance printing actually worked. Um, some, for instance, rely on very specifically on how the words and letters appear on the page of early printed texts. Um, however, such proposals assume consistency in a print run, uh, that all copies of the first folio, for instance, are identical. In fact, uh, no extent copy of the first folio is identical to any other copy of the first folio. Uh, moreover, while Shakespeare's works maintain their fascination for us for their literary qualities, theories based on codes tend to reduce those literary qualities to incidental happenstance. Basically, Hamlet is nice and all, but what's really important is the secret message uh, you can get, discover when you send in for your little orphan Annie Dakota ring. <laughs> Spoiler, it involves Ovaltine. Um, <laughs> most theories arguing for alternative authorship, even those involving ciphers, depend to some extent on reading the plays and poems as autobiographical. Uh, to be fair, Shakespeare deniers are not the only people who do this, but it's, it's always kind of problematic. Most of the works attributed to Shakespeare, for instance, are plays. Um, so you end up with a char Shakespeare's characters expressing the most noble ideals, the, the vilest villainy, and the most craven cowardice. So how do we decide um, which bits accurately express the author's ideas uh, or, or reveal information about his life. And, and generally the answer involves cherry picking and confirmation bias, which is, is generally not the right way to go. Um, now the sonnets might seem more fertile uh, ground to reap an autobiographical harvest. Uh, after all, they're in the first person and they seem to offer an, an intimate portrayal of the speaker. Of course, they're crafted to seem th that way. Um, that's kind of what lyric poetry does. So we have no idea whether the young man, the dark lady, the rival poet, actually existed anywhere outside Shakespeare's imagination. We don't even know whether the poem's speaker had anything in common with Shakespeare aside from the first name, William. Um, and then even if the characters in the sonnets were based <laughs> on real people, we have no idea to what extent the people and events uh, were fictionalized and stylized. For instance, it's generally agreed that the Stella from Sir Philip Sidney's uh, sonnet sequence, Astrophel and Stella, uh, was based on L Lady Penelope Rich. But <laughs> Scholars generally doubt that Sidney really suffered a huge uh, unrequited passion for Lady Penelope. She was just a literary convenience. Finally, even if Shakespeare's sonnets are genuinely autobiographical, we have no idea who the young man, the dark lady, and the rival poet are or were. They're probably dead now. We can probably say that. Um, sometimes people state unequivocally that the young man was based on Henry Risley, the Earl of Southampton, as if you know, it were an absolute established fact. But as far as we know, the only connection between Shakespeare and Southampton is that Shakespeare dedicated two poems to Southampton. Um, poets didn't earn money from selling their works or doing public readings. 
uh, they needed patrons, so they dedicated their works to patrons or potential patrons. They didn't all form intimate friendships with those patrons. Another problem uh, with trying to locate the man in the works is what people actually find. John Mitchell, who purports to consider the authorship question objectively, but uh, doesn't really, um, but still he, he came up with, compiled a list of Shakespeare specialties. Uh, these are areas in which the author must have had uh, expert knowledge according to various arguments. Um, and I should note, this is really quite a partial list, uh, but it will suffice to make a point. Shakespeare deniers often argue that William Shakespeare was a barely literate provincial yabo who was only interested in money and couldn't possibly have written the lovely works attributed to him. But the arguments of deniers suggest that even the polymathiest of polymaths isn't polymath enough <laughs> to be expert in all the areas that the poet must have been an expert in, uh, even if he hadn't been s far too busy with his day job. Um, even if we assume, as some people do, that Shakespeare was really a syndicate of intellectuals led by Bacon and Sir, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, it's still not good enough. So we're really left then with my personal theory, which is that uh, the Earl of Oxford was a time-traveling alien <laughs> who also wrote the Canterbury Tales and Beowulf. I have evidence. It's not good evidence, but it's good enough. Uh, unfortunately, that's, I don't have time for that. Um, a final problem uh, with autobiographical readings is that they, too, diminish the importance of the poetry. Even when deniers eschew ciphers and codes, they still look for hidden messages. In addition, Shakespeare truthers are prone to what might be called Shakespearean literalism. Uh, for example, the Wikipedia entry on the Marlovian theory of Shakespeare authorship contains the following paragraph in the section on the sonnets. Marlovians also claim that their interpretation allows more of Shakespeare's actual words to be interpreted as meaning literally what they say than is otherwise possible. For example, they can, they can take a wretch's knife in Sonnet 74 to mean a wretch's knife rather than assume that he must really have meant old father time's scythe take an outcast state in Sonnet 29 to mean an outcast state, not just a feeling that nobody likes him, and accept that when he says his name receives a brand in Sonnet 111, it means his, his reputation has been permanently damaged and not simply that acting is considered a somewhat disreputable profession. Such thinking represents a dire misunderstanding of what poetry actually is and how it works. <laughs> It's like, look, the poetry is less poetic now. Um, this is particularly odd coming from Marlovians, whose chosen candidate is the only one uh, who was a professional poet whose, whose verse actually rivals Shakespeare's. He was a great poet. Um, Marlowe himself was known to have, on occasion, used figurative language. <laughs> Unless we're to assume that he meant that Helen of Troy physically launched a thousand <laughs> ships <laughs> with her face, <laughs> while somehow maintaining sufficient beauty to inspire a 10-year war. <laughs> so if ciphers and coded biography, autobiography, aren't the right sort of evidence to use to assess authorship, what evidence should we consider? Uh, stylistic analysis is, is crucial. In re recent years, analysis of style has benefited from computer-assisted stylometrics, uh, which have been used in most modern studies of collaboration, for instance. But to a large extent, computational stylistics augment and build upon uh, work that's been done for centuries. Unfortunately, the subject of poetic style is too large, complicated, and technical for me to cover competently today. Also, frankly, end stop and jamment, feminine endings, grammar, that sort of thing it might be a tiny bit dull. Um, so today I'm going to focus on documentary evidence. 
Charlton Ogborn, who revived the case for Oxford's authorship in the 20th century, has said, no one we know ever suggested during Shakespeare's life that he was the author of Shakespeare, or an author of any kind. Shakespeare's contemporaries made it quite plain that they did not consider the Stratford man the author. So far as we can tell, Shakespeare did not come to be generally accepted as the author until two generations or more after his death. Actually, quite a lot of documentary evidence exists. I'll begin with the works published in Shakespeare's lifetime and shortly after his death. Now, only a small per percentage of Elizabethan and Jacobean plays survive, uh, and many were published anonymously. For instance, Thomas Haywood said that he had an entire hand, or at least a main finger, in 220 plays, but only around 23 plays and eight masks survive that are firmly attributed to him. Some of Shakespeare's plays, especially the earliest ones, uh, were initially published anonymously. The first work to be published with Shakespeare's name attached is not a play, but a narrative poem, Venus and Adonis. And don't worry, his name's not actually on that slide. Uh, that was published in 1593. For a period of around 18 months in 1593 and 1594, the London playhouses were closed almost continuously because of an outbreak of plague. Um, it was a difficult time for actors, playwrights, and the companies themselves. The companies toured the provinces. Some of them didn't survive. Um, and Shakespeare may have spent some time on the road with an acting company, but he also took the time to try to find a patron. On April 18, 1593, Venus, Venus and Adonis was entered uh, it, without an author's name attached in the stationer's register in which printers and publishers documented their rights to publish a work. The publisher was Richard Field, who was also from Stratford-on-Avon. Uh, the poem was in print by June 12th when a man named Richard Stonley recorded his purchase of a copy. Shakespeare's name does not appear on the title page. It only appears on the dedication page. It should be noted uh, that it would be almost inconceivable for the Earl of Oxford or one of the other aristocratic contenders to dedicate a, world, a work to the Earl of Southampton, in spe, especially in such terms. For one thing, Oxford wouldn't have needed a patron. He was a patron. That was the job of the aristocrats. And a narrative poem on classical themes didn't have the same sort of stigma that plays had for the, the common people. So his need for such an elaborate ruse seems questionable. Furthermore, Oxford was Southampton's social equal and decades older than the then 19-year-old Earl. Uh, Marlavians, on the other hand, point out that Venus and Adonis was entered into the station's register as an anonymous poem before Marlowe died and probably appeared only in, pr in print uh, in Shakespeare's name only after Marlowe's supposed death on May 30th. Since Marlowe spent most of Shakespeare's career dead, <laughs> Marlovian claims are impossible unless Marlowe and his cronies in some way faked his death and uh, managed to supply a corpse for the coroner's inquest. Uh, fun. Uh, when Marlovians question the timing of Venus and Adonis, they're implying that Marlowe began using the name Shakespeare with the publication of Venus and Adonis. However, if Venus and Adonis was known to have been complete and ready for print before Marlowe's death, which it was, there's no reason it couldn't have been printed in his name. In fact, the notoriety of his violent death could only have increased sales. Uh, meanwhile, Hero and Leander, Marlowe's own erotic narrative poem on classical themes, remained unfinished and unpublished uh, at his death uh, and remained so for many years. Shakespeare quoted it in As You Like It, but it never appeared in his name. It was completed years later by George Chapman. Venus and Adonis was, printed, was reprinted 15 times before 1640, making it Shakespeare's best-selling work uh, during the Renaissance. It went through almost twice as many editions as Shakespeare's most popular play, Henry IV, Part I. According to Shakespeare documented an online exhibition conven convened by the Folger Shakespeare Library, 
Venus and Adonis was the most popular work of vernacular poetry of the entire period. Now, in the dedication to Venus and Adonis, Shakespeare promised to honor Southampton with some graver labor. He made good on his promise in the following year uh, with the publication of The Rape of Lucrece. Uh, as with Venus and Adonis, Shakespeare's name did not appear on the title page uh, of the first edition, only on the dedication page. Most people consider this dedication to be in warmer terms, more personal terms than the dedication accompanying Venus and Adonis, but it's still not out of the ordinary for the time. And this does mark the last uh, con known relationship that we have between Shakespeare and Southampton. Uh, although not quite as popular as Venus and Adonis, The Rape of Lucrece was also reprinted many times. In the same year uh, that rape, The Rape of Lucrece was published, Shakespeare's professional situation improved. A new playing company was formed, the Lord Chamberlain's Men. Uh, Shakespeare was a sh shareholder in the company, an actor, and its principal playwright. He later became part owner of the Globe and Blackfriars Theatres. This position gave uh, Shakespeare financial stability. He was the first playwright to have this kind of relationship with a, a company. Uh, by the fall of 1594, the plague had abated and the Chamberlain's men began performing in London. 1594 also saw the publication of two of his early plays, Titus Andronicus, uh, and also uh, the first part of the contention, contention betwixt the two famous houses of York and Lancaster, also known as Henry VI Part II. Neither was published in his name, and you can tell Titus was being performed before the Chamberlain's Men was formed because it mentions several other companies, not, but not the, the Chamberlain's Men. Um, the Taming of A Shrew, usually regarded as a, a very corrupt pirated redaction of The Taming of The Shrew, was publi published the same year. In the following years, uh, more plays were published, some in pirated texts, or bad quartos as they're known, uh, all without an author's name. In 1598, however, the second quarto of Richard II uh, was published with Shakespeare's name on the title page, as was the second quarto of Richard III, and the first quarto of Love's Labor's Lost, uh, which had also been performed uh, during Christmas fest festivities before the Queen. Roughly half Shakespeare's plays were printed during his lifetime. Most were printed officially after the play, uh, playing company, uh, which owned them, sold the playbooks to printers, but some were not published uh, legitimately. But after 1598, most, not all, but most, both official and pirated plays were published in Shakespeare's name, uh, including the very odd first quarto of Hamlet, um, in which the famous soliloquy begins, to be or not to be, I, there's the point. To die, to sleep, is that all? I, all. <laughs> yeah. Um, as you can see, Hamlet, uh, for the Hamlet first quarto was published in 1603, uh, the year James I ascended the throne and the Lord Chambers, Chamberlain's men became the king's men. In 1609, the sonnets were published with his, Shakespeare's name in big old letters. Uh, it was probably printed without uh, his permission. The publisher, Thomas Thorpe, as I mentioned, included a dedication. Uh, th this has been confusing absolutely everyone for 400 years. Uh, the punctuation doesn't help. <laughs> Needs more periods. Um, so is our ever-living poet Shakespeare or God? Uh, they're hard to tell apart sometimes. Is the only begetter the young man who inspired the poems, the person who pr procured the poems, or the poet? Uh, who on earth is Mr. W.H.? One suggestion is that Mr. W.H. refers to Henry Risley, uh, the Earl of Southampton, but with his cl initials cleverly reversed. <laughs> um, others who have suggested it's William Herbert, Herbert the Earl of Pembroke, Pembroke. Uh, who's been proposed as both the young man of the sonnets and as the real Shakespeare. Um, regardless, no Earl would ever be referred to as Mr. It, it's just not something that was done. 
Um, it's possible that WH is a mistake for WS or WSH uh, and actually refers to Shakespeare, but who knows. The obscurity of the dedication is assured that it has been uh, subject to decipherment, as mentioned previously. These decipherments have proven definitively that several different people uh, are the real authors of Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, whoever does the decipherment comes up with a different answer. But it's always definitive. Because of Shakespeare's popularity on stage and in print, it was perhaps inevitable that, his wor that works he did not write uh, would end up being published in his name. One example is The Passionate Pilgrim, which went through two editions in 1599. Five of the 20 poems actually are by Shakespeare. Uh, two sonnets, which had not been published at that time previously at that time, and three poems from Love's Labor's Lost. The other works, however, are not Shakespeare. Uh, among the works not by Shakespeare uh, is Marlowe's exceptionally popular poem, The Passionate Shepherd to His Love, combined into a single poem with Walter Raleigh's The Nymph's Reply to the Shepherd. In 1612, Jaggard published a third edition of The Passionate Pilgrim, still credited to Shakespeare, now apparently also playing on the popularity of Venus and Adonis. Uh, and the title page notes that two new works have been added. These were not by Shakespeare either. Uh, in fact, they came from Thomas Haywood's Troia Britannica, which Jaggard had published in 1609, so he knew exactly who wrote them. Uh, Haywood was understandably miffed. In an apology for actors, Haywood wrote, here, likewise, I must necessarily insert a manifest injury done to me in that work by taking the two epistles of Paris to Helen and Helen to Paris and printing them in a less volume under the name of another, which may put the world in opinion I might steal them from him, and he, to do himself right, hath since published them in his own name. But as, as I must acknowledge my lines not worthy his patronage, under whom he hath published them, so the author I know much offended with Mr. Jaggard, that altogether unknown to him presumed to make so bold with his name. Uh, he's not really clear with pronoun reference, but he expresses concern uh, that he might be accused of sh uh, plagiarizing Shakespeare, whom he seems to respect. He also notes that Shakespeare, too, was angry and had complained to Jaggard. Ultimately, Jaggard did remove Shakespeare's name from the title page, possibly because of Shakespeare's complaints. In 1623, seven years after Shakespeare's death, two of his colleagues from the acting company, John Hemmings and, William, er, and Henry Condell, edited a collection of his plays, including 18 that had not previously been published, uh, into what is known as the first folio, now also available in t-shirt form. Uh, it was printed by William Jaggard's son, Isaac. So I guess him going, no, sorry, I'll take that off, uh, worked. Um, in their address to the readers, Hemmings and Condell note that these re readers have been abused with diverse stolen and uh, surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors that exposed them even those are now offered to your view, cured and perfect of their limbs, and all the rest absolute in their numbers, suggesting that they have included all of Shakespeare's plays. In fact, some collaborations have been omitted, including Pericles written with George Wilkins and two noble kinsmen written with John Fletcher, although both are now pretty much universally accepted as part of the Shakespeare canon. Hemings and Con Condell also do not uh, acknowledge any of Shakespeare's collaborators. Not even Fletcher, who also co-wrote Henry VIII, which is in the first folio. Fletcher became the Kingsman's principal playwright after Shakespeare's retirement, so they must have known that he co-wrote the plays, but, or co-wrote Henry VIII, but they don't give him credit. The first folio doesn't contain the vast collection of commendatory verses that often accompany such works but it does contain one very fine one, written by Shakespeare's friend and friendly rival, Ben Jonson. In this poem, Jonson famously says that Shakespeare had small Latin and less Greek. 
Shakespeare deniers take this to mean that Shakespeare didn't have the necessary knowledge to write his plays. Um, however, small Latin is relative. Uh, Shakespeare definitely was not the classicist that Johnson was. Furthermore, Johnson immediately follows the statement by comparing Shakespeare favorably with classical writers. He would uh, call Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, Euripides back to life to hear Shakespeare's busk and tread and shake a stage. Uh, triumph, my Britain, he says, uh, thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of Europe homage owe. He was not of an age, but for all time. Johnson also calls Shakespeare sweet swan of Avon, indicating that he really did mean the Glover's son from Stratford upon Avon. Now, you may ask how Shakespeare deniers could possibly have missed all these subtle clues <laughs> that the plays and poems attributed to Shakespeare were written by Shakespeare. And of course, they haven't missed it. They argue that the William Shakespeare on the title page of these works refers to someone other than William Shakespeare, actor and son of a Stratford Glover. And it all has to do with spelling. You see, in Shakespeare's six authentic signatures, he spelled his name various ways, but always without the E after the K. Uh, in many of the title pages, the name is spelled with an E after the K. Sometimes, and this is terribly important, there's also a hyphen. <laughs> now you may recall that Timothy Van Gelder and Charlton Ogburn insistently refer to Shakespeare as Shakespeare. Um, that's the hallmark of a Shakespeare denier. This is a very silly argument. Um, spelling was not standardized in Shakespeare's day. Shakespeare was not an uncommon name, and it was spelled in a huge variety of ways. Uh, it's all the same name. Everyone would have recognized it as the same name. I'll give just a couple examples of Elizabethan spelling practices. First, these are both uh, signatures of Walter Raleigh. The handwriting actually looks a bit different, but they're both uh, genuine. On the bottom, he spells his name R-A-L-E-G-H. On the top, he spells it R-A-W-L-E-Y. Same name. Um, the next example is Christopher Marlowe's only known signature. He spells Christopher with an F, and he spells Marlowe Marley, which is not even pronounced the same way. Um, his contemporaries spell the name variously as Marlowe, Marley, and Morley. Again, it's the same name. Aside from the variability of re Renaissance spellings, authors didn't get to dictate how their names were spelled in publications. That was the printer. Um, and they especially didn't get to choose how their names were spelled in pirated texts where they didn't give their permission for the text to be published at all. Um, it's more likely that in at least some cases that the printer spelled Shakespeare with an E and or a hyphen to avoid having the, the K and the long S right next to each other. When there are two long ascenders right next to each other, they could become damaged in the printing process. Um, so the most parsimonious explanation for the presence of Shakespeare's name on Shakespeare's works is that Shakespeare wrote them. <laughs> Some convoluted conspiracy theory involving the most common letter in the English language is slightly less likely. Shakespeare was also mentioned as a poet and playwright during his lifetime. Although the number of references isn't huge, I'll only go through some of the most significant instances. And I'll also only use examples where Shakespeare is clearly identified uh, along with his work. The first reference to him appears in 1592, when Shakespeare was just beginning his career as a playwright. Uh, none of his works had been published, and Marlowe was still alive. So they're active at the same time. Uh, like Marlowe, Robert Greene was one of a group of writers known as University Wits. He had a BA from Cambridge as well as an MA in Divinity. He was a poet, a playwright, a pamphleteer, and brothel enthusiast. Uh, he was well known for his dissipation. At the end of his life, he allegedly wrote, 
Green's Groat's Worth of Wit Bought with a Million of Repentance. According to the title page, the work describes the folly of youth, the falsehood of makeshift flatterers, the misery of the negligent, and mischiefs of deceiving courtesans. Uh, it was supposedly written before his death and published at his dying request. It's possible he didn't actually write it, but regardless, the fact that it was published posthumously was used to promote it, which again, if Marlowe had written Venus and Adonis, it should have been in his name. So in the, the, this work, he begins by telling the story of one Roberto, uh, but then eventually admits that he's Roberto, and, and he sort of drops that guise. Um, and eventually, he addresses three unnamed gentlemen of his quondam acquaintance that spend their wits in making plays and urges them to mend their ways. Although he doesn't name them, one who's said to be an atheist is almost certainly Christopher Marlowe. Uh, the others are probably George Peel, who is also well known for his dissipation, and Thomas Nash. At one point, Green rails against actors. He actually does it in a couple places. But here he says, base-minded men, all three of you, if by my misery you be not warned. For unto none of you, like me, sought those burrs to cleave, those puppets, I mean, that spake from our mouths, those antics garnished in our colors. It is, not is it not strange that I, to whom they all have been beholding, is it not like that you, to whom they all have been beholding, shall, were ye in that case that I am now, be both at once of them forsaken? Yes, trust them not, for there is an upstart crow beautified in our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you, being an absolute uh, Johannes factotum, in, is in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country. It's not entirely clear what uh, Green is accusing Shakespeare of, plagiarizing the university wit's works, play fixing, editing, and augmenting uh, plays written by you know, his betters, uh, or simply just being a, a jumped up little player who's no better than he should be. Um, regardless, Shakespeare clearly seems to be the target. He puns on his name um, and parodies the line, O Tiger's Heart Wrapped in a Woman's Hide from Henry VI Part Three. And all the, though the Henry VI uh, plays are thought to be collaborations, that is a, a Shakespeare line. Shakespeare is also clearly identified as an actor and, again, as active as, at the same time as Marlowe was actors, active, so they were both writing. Interestingly, by the time Groat's Worth of Wit was published, it's possible that Shakespeare had collaborated with all three of the university wits addressed in the work. Um, Marlowe on the Henry VI plays, Nash on Henry VI Part I, and Peele on Titus. Somewhat less, less scathing than Grotesworth are the Parnassus plays, a trilogy of satiric comedies uh, associated with St. John's College, Cambridge, written between 1598 and 1602. The plays, plays mention Shakespeare several times. Gullio, an impressionable, fashionable, and not too terribly bright character, worships sweet Mr. Shakespeare. Uh, he refers to Shakespeare as sweet repeatedly. According to Andrew Hadfield, this is, quote, a sign that Shakespeare is considered to be adept at producing mellifluous Ovidian verse, but that, in the author's opinion, he lacks the true seriousness of a major poet, such as Edmund Spencer, who is pra praised throughout as the best English poet since Chaucer, unquote. Judicio, who, as his name suggests, is a wiser character than Gullio, says of Shakespeare, <laughs> Who loves not Adam's love or Lucrece's rape, which is an unfortunate way of putting it. Uh, his sweeter verse contains heart-throbbing line, could but a graver subject him content without love's foolish languishment. The Parnassus plays also quote Romeo and Juliet and Richard III. The anonymous author uh, displays a thorough knowledge of the English stage and contemporary English poetry, and he clearly identifies Shakespeare as a playwright and a poet. Poet Richard Barnfield's assess assessment of Shakespeare is very similar uh, to that of the author of the Parnassus plays. 
At least two Barnfield's poems appeared in The Passionate Pilgrim under Shakespeare's name. Poor guy. Uh, and Barnfield, like Shakespeare, uh, addressed a sonnet, se a sonnet sequence to a man. They were the only two who did in, in the, uh, that time. And some believe that he's the rival poet alluded to in Shakespeare's sonnets. Be that as it may, Barnfield published a, a, a remembrance of some English poets in his 1598 collection, Poems in Diverse Humors. Like the Parnassus author, Barnfield considers Spencer the most important and talented of living poets, followed by Samuel Daniel and Michael Drayton. Shakespeare squeaks in to fourth place. Um, uh, and uh, Barnfield says, and Shakespeare thou, whose honey flowing vein pleasing the world, thy praises doth obtain, whose Venus, whose Lucrece, sweet and chaste, thy name and fame's immortal book have placed, live you ever, at least in fame live ever. Well may the body die, but fame dies never. The Parnassus uh, author identified Shakespeare's work as sweet, here it's honey flowing, and pleasing to the world. Compared to uh, Barnfield's praises of other poets, however, there is again a suggestion that Shakespeare's work is perhaps a bit lightweight and too crowd-pleasing. While Barnfield only mentions Shakespeare's narrative poem, poems, Francis Mears is happy to mention his plays. Mears was a provincial clergyman who in 1598 published his only claim to fame, Pilatus Tamia Wit's Treasury, an exceedingly long and stunningly dull uh, and tedious work in which he compares stuff to other stuff. Uh, okay. Eventually he gets to poetry. He mentions Shakespeare several times, um, although other times, uh, other poets more often. He mentions, lists a bunch of Shakespeare's plays, including Love's Labor's One, which doesn't survive, um, and his, his sugared sonnets. Uh, he also mentions Oxford as a writer of uh, comedies, but he mentions Shakespeare as a writer of comedies too. So it's good for Oxfordians, not so good for Oxfordians. And again, it, it, over and over, Shakespeare is referred to as sweet, honeyed, sugared. Um, so it's difficult to imagine that all the people who mentioned Shakespeare and his works during his lifetime or shortly after his death uh, were part of a conspiracy. That they were really saying, what they were really saying was sh sweet Shakespeare, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, and some of the writers who mentioned Shakespeare were part of a close circle uh, of writers. They knew well who Shakespeare was, a playwright, a poet, and an actor. Keep in mind that the playwrights, many other playwrights wrote for Shakespeare's company. Um, so Shakespeare was, was one of the arbiters uh, of who decided which plays were going to be performed by the company. It's difficult to imagine that they wouldn't have noticed that Shakespeare was, as is claimed, practically illiterate. Uh, this is particularly true of Ben Jonson. He knew Shakespeare personally. Shakespeare appeared in at least two of his plays. Um, he praised Shakespeare in the, the first folio, but he was also sometimes more critical. Uh, years after Shakespeare's death, Jonson wrote, I remember the players have often mentioned it as an honor to Shakespeare that in his writing, whatsoever he penned, he never blotted out a line. My answer hath been, would he had blotted a thousand, which they thought a malevolent speech. Uh, I had not told posterity this, but for their ignorance, who choose to that circumstance to commend their friend by uh, wherein he most faulted, and to justify mine own candor, for I love the man, and do honor his memory on this side idolatry, uh, as much as any. He was indeed honest, and of an open and free nature had an excellent fantasy, brave notions, and gentle expression, wherein he flowed with that facility that sometimes it was necessary he should be stopped. <laughs> his wit was in his own power, would the rule of it had been so too. But he redeemed his vices with his virtues. There was ever more in him to be praised than to be pardoned. So stick that in your Bayesian equation and smoke it. Thank you.